Uh, so I'm here with uh, Ralph Simon, uh, the head of Mobilium International uh, at the World Creators Summit. So hi, Ralph, and uh, thanks for coming on. How's it going? Things are good. It's always uh, very good to be at this biannual event, which is really an excellent time to review the state and uh, the state of the copyright nations, and also looking at what new improvements can be done and what's being brought about by the demands of screen agers. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, talking about uh, Mobilium, uh, what does the company do for people that haven't heard about it? Mobilium is a company that is headquartered in London. It has associate offices in Mumbai, in Los Angeles, and in Johannesburg. It concentrates on finding new ways of implementing mobile content, mobile entertainment, mobile health, and all innovation with mobile, everything to do with mobile, and more importantly today, multi-screens. Yeah. Because today we are living in an environment where screen ages are everything. Yeah, and uh, one of the key components of mobile, which is becoming so important in, 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 in today's life, is uh, the fact that people are still trying to figure out the advertising component. So do you think we're getting s s uh, somewhere to, to arriving to discovering the key to monetizing mobile? Uh, in terms of advertising on devices, I think that that's, uh, it's been spoken about for a number of years. There's nothing that's really very definitive other than what one is seeing uh, in terms of YouTube or Google-related search activity. But in terms of advertising per se, um, it's, uh, mobile users generally don't like to have their content disrupted by advertising. Although if you look, for example, at Spotify, which uh, has a lot of their music uh, delivered on mobile now, of their 24 million users, only 6 million are paid not to get advertising. So you're getting 18 million that do get some kind of advertising, even if it's one or two ads an hour or two hours or something yeah. like that. I'm not sure of the exact specifics. Yeah. And one company that's, for example, doing something interesting is uh, uh, TuneIn. They are uh, using the screen as an advertising display so that when you're listening to the radio, they are showing you adverts. Uh, I guess they took a cue from Amazon, which has display advertising on, on the Kindles when you have, for example, the device switched off. Do you think, how do you think people might react to seeing adverts on, pop up on the screen when they are listening to music, for example? I think uh, people tune out where their ears are tuning in because I think that already, they say that uh, in an average day, people in Europe or in uh, America see 3,000 images in a day. And I think that uh, a lot of the extraneous images just don't really register. Uh, it's kind of like banner ads became. And uh, so my personal view is that uh, you don't get qualitative uh, pickup or uh, throughput with that kind of advertising. Yeah, sure. And talking about the, the rise of the smartphone, you know, uh, how is that performing in, for example, in the brick territories? And do you think that the rise of, of cheaper smartphones are going to start to uh, get those devices trickle down to, to uh, developing territories that have uh, so far been mostly concentrated on feature phones? Uh, it's been interesting dynamic. There are about 7 billion mobile phone users worldwide now this year, 2013. There'll be sales of between 1.1 and 1.2 billion phones. There is a huge demand for touchscreen smartphones and an insatiable demand for low-cost touchscreen smartphones in the emerging markets of Africa, Latin America, Russia, uh, although that's quite uh, well developed at this point, but uh, certainly in Asia Pacific, Vietnam, um, Indonesia, you're seeing a tremendous pickup. Uh, and in Africa, the most pertinent new element, of course, is the connection of the submarine cables that's allowing mobile internet. So mobile internet plus low-cost smartphones, a lot of the manufacturers are in the race. Huawei from China, Nokia with a low-cost phone, Samsung certainly bringing out a low-cost device. This is really a very important new trend. Yeah, and I, I'm, I keep seeing uh, different uh, po points of view when it comes to native apps versus uh, mobile web. And uh, some people are saying, oh, I'm stopping with my native app because I think mobile web is one. Other people are saying, look, I think I can get more features into my native app. So I've actually gone from having a mobile web presence to developing a native app for, for a smartphone. So uh, where do you stand in that debate? I think what uh, seems to be consistent in the research is that if people have between 30 to 40 apps on their phone, their device, they generally tend to only use three to five in any one time or any one week. It's strange because uh, people perhaps like to fill a refrigerator full of food, but only eat a little amount of food at each time. And I think that same analogy could be said to be consistent in the mobile space. 
Um, a lot of it is also contextual and colloquial. So, for example, uh, in certain countries, like let's take, for example, in Indonesia, if there are Bahasa, local language, Bahasa apps that have got particular contextual relevance, those will be the ones that people will go for. And what might seem to be very pertinent international apps sometimes don't really connect at a local level. Yeah, sure. And looking at the uh, you know the the global picture of of carriers and music services, and of course we know that uh, in the UK, for example, most carriers have abandoned their own proprietary music services because uh, they didn't really work uh, that well or as well as as uh, uh, standalone enterprises. So, what is the situation in in other territories uh, other than Europe and the US? And do you see carriers still working on their own services and licensed music for distribution? Well, the, the big uh, development obviously has been uh, trying to mimic the success of Pandora. 200 million users of about 70 million on a regular basis. Spotify, 24 million. And Deezer coming up fast on the back track. 20 million users. Now they say they're operating in 182 countries. The access model is starting to get some traction in different countries. Like, for example, in India, Artist Allowed is a very popular service that's run by a company called Hungama, very well-known Indian aggregator and Bollywood specialist. Uh, but in general, what is tending to happen, particularly in the emerging countries, is there's a big, big demand for local content, colloquial content. So, for example, in Kenya, it tends to be a demand for Swahili language product. Um, and, uh, of course, there is still a great demand for the Lady Gagas and... Uh, Jay-Z's of the world, but contextually colloquial content is the driver uh, in certainly in most of the international markets. Absolutely. And uh, you interviewed a couple of weeks ago Rob Wells, uh, head of digital universal music uh, at Music Matters. So he talked about the inevitability of seeing more global superstars uh, coming up from Asia. So do you agree with that uh, uh, statement? And do you, uh, what do you think it takes for uh, an artist to break out of, uh, of Asia? Uh, if not just you know a fantastically viral video, is is there you know any other ways that it can come through? You're obviously referring to Psy and Gangnam Style. It's going to be interesting to see what happens to his follow-up single called Gentleman. But I think that definitely uh, what you're going to see is two key things. You definitely are going to see some important act emerging from the east to the west. There's one that uh, one of the major labels are putting a lot of time and effort into. It's the great Bollywood actress. Priyanka Chopra. She's just done some duets with Will I Am, with Avicii, with Pitbull. So that's going to be a very interesting test. Uh, the second, uh, of course, is that uh, well known artist managers, Justin Timberlake's manager, Johnny Wright, very experienced, uh, very uh, successful song picker, feels that he wants to be someone who finds a Chinese artist that he can break in the West. And of course, uh, the key in these markets too is the diaspora. There are many Chinese that live outside of China. There are many Nigerians who live outside of Nigeria. There are many Ghanaians who live outside of Ghana. There are many Thais who live outside of Thailand. What I've been noticing too is that YouTube is spawning some new artists and stars, 10 million plus views, and those would connect into the diasporian communities outside of their home countries. Like for example, I recently saw a Filipino singer that developed more than 10 million views on uh, on YouTube and the Filipino communities all around the world in the Middle East and in the United States all of a sudden globbing onto this particular artist. I think that's going to be an emerging uh, rippling trend that we're going to see more of. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we see that in London sometimes with the uh, uh, big uh, concerts by Polish artists, for example, or artists from Eastern Europe. So that's, that's definitely a trend. Contextual, re contextual relevance, absolutely correct. People like to be able to relate to something that's part of them. But then equally, someone like a Lady Gaga, if Lady Gaga was really smart, and she is, and her manager is very smart, Troy Carter, she would record her material with her voice in Hindi or in Mandarin or in Bahasa and she would increase her uh, online following by a huge magnitude. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Well, thanks so much for your time and uh, absolutely uh, I, I would encourage people to follow, follow your work at Mobilium if they want to keep up to date with the latest uh, on what's happening on mobile. Final word, sure. we're on the lookout for things that will appeal to screenagers, yeah. screenagers of any age. A screenager, multi-screen, viewing, lean forward, not lean back. That's what we look for. Thank you so much.